experience, not from reasoning or reflection. The statement, what begins must have a cause, he says, is not one that has intuitive certainty, like the statements of logic. As he puts it, there is no object which implies the existence of any other if we consider these objects in themselves and never look beyond the ideas which we form of them. Hume argues from this that it must be experience that gives knowledge of cause and effect, but that it cannot be merely the experience of the two events A and B which are in a causal relation to each other. It must be experience because the connection is not logical, and it cannot be merely the experience of the particular events A and B since we can discover nothing in A by itself which should lead it to produce B. The experience required, he says, is that of the constant conjunction of events of the kind A with events of the kind B. He points out that when, in experience, two objects are constantly conjoined, we do in fact infer one from the other. When he says infer, he means that perceiving the one makes us expect the other. He does not mean a formal or explicit inference. Perhaps the necessary connection depends on the inference, not vice versa. That is to say, the sight of A causes the expectation of B, and so leads us to believe that there is a necessary connection between A and B. The inference is not determined by reason, since that would require us to assume the uniformity of nature, which itself is not necessary, but only inferred from experience. Hume is thus led to the view that, when we say A causes B, we mean only that A and B are constantly conjoined in fact, not that there is some necessary connection between them. We have no other notion of cause and effect but that of certain objects which have been always conjoined together. We cannot penetrate into the reason of the conjunction. He backs up his theory with a definition of belief, which is, he maintains, a lively idea related to or associated with a present impression. Through association, if A and B have been constantly conjoined in past experience, the impression of A produces that lively idea of B which constitutes belief in B. This explains why we believe A and B to be connected. The percept of A is connected with the idea of B, and so we come to think that A is connected with B, though this opinion is really groundless. Objects have no discoverable connection together nor is it from any other principle but custom operating upon the imagination that we can draw any inference from the appearance of one to the experience of another. He repeats many times the contention that what appears to us as necessary connection among objects is really only connection among the ideas of those objects. The mind is determined by custom and tis this impression or determination which affords me the idea of necessity. The repetition of instances, which leads us to the belief that A causes B, gives nothing new in the object, but in the mind leads to an association of ideas. Thus, necessity is something that exists in the mind, not in objects. Let us now ask ourselves what we are to think of Hume's doctrine. It has two parts, one objective, the other subjective. The objective part says, when we judge that A causes B, what has in fact happened, so far as A and B are concerned, is that they have been frequently observed to be conjoined. That is, A has been immediately, or very quickly, followed by B. We have no right to say that A must be followed by B, or will be followed by B on future occasions. Nor have we any ground for supposing that, however often A is followed by B, any relation beyond sequence is involved. In fact, causation is definable in terms of sequence and is not an independent notion. The subjective part of the doctrine says, the frequently observed conjunction of A and B causes the impression of A to cause the idea of B. But if we are to define cause as is suggested in the objective part of the doctrine, we must reword the above. Substituting the definition of cause, the above becomes it has been frequently observed that the frequently observed conjunction of two objects, A and B, has been frequently followed by occasions on which the impression of A was followed by the idea of B. This statement, we may admit, is true, but it has hardly the scope that Hume attributes to the subjective part of his doctrine. He contends over and over again that the frequent conjunction of A and B gives no reason for expecting them to be conjoined in the future, but is merely a cause of this expectation. 
that is to say, experience of frequent conjunction is frequently conjoined with a habit of association. But if the objective part of Hume's doctrine is accepted, the fact that, in the past, associations have been frequently formed in such circumstances is no reason for supposing that they will continue, or that new ones will be formed in similar circumstances. The fact is that, where psychology is concerned, Hume allows himself to believe in causation in a sense which, in general, he condemns. Let us take an illustration. I see an apple, and expect that, if I eat it, I shall experience a certain kind of taste. According to Hume, there is no reason why I should experience this kind of taste. The law of habit explains the existence of my expectation, but does not justify it. But the law of habit is itself a causal law. Therefore, if we take Hume seriously, we must say, although in the past the sight of an apple has been conjoined with expectation of a certain kind of taste, there is no reason why it should continue to be so conjoined. Perhaps the next time I see an apple, I shall expect it to taste like roast beef. You may at the moment think this unlikely, but that is no reason for expecting that you will think it unlikely five minutes hence. If Hume's objective doctrine is right, we have no better reason for expectations in psychology than in the physical world. Hume's theory might be caricatured as follows. The proposition A causes B means the impression of A causes the idea of B. As a definition, this is not a happy effort. We must therefore examine Hume's objective doctrine more closely. This doctrine has two parts. 1. When we say A causes B, all that we have a right to say is that, in past experience, A and B have frequently appeared together or in rapid succession, and no instance has been observed of A not followed or accompanied by B. 2. However many instances we may have observed of the conjunction of A and B, that gives no reason for expecting them to be conjoined on a future occasion. Though it is a cause of this expectation, that is, it has been frequently observed to be conjoined with such an expectation. These two parts of the doctrine may be stated as follows. 1. In causation, there is no indefinable relation except conjunction or succession. 2. Induction by simple enumeration is not a valid form of argument. Empiricists, in general, have accepted the first of these theses and rejected the second. When I say they have rejected the second, I mean that they have believed that, given a sufficiently vast accumulation of instances of a conjunction, the likelihood of the conjunction being found in the next instance will exceed a half. Or, if they have not held exactly this, they have maintained some doctrine having similar consequences. I do not wish at the moment to discuss induction, which is a large and difficult subject. For the moment, I am content to observe that, if the first half of Hume's doctrine is admitted, the rejection of induction makes all expectation as to the future irrational, even the expectation that we shall continue to feel expectations. I do not mean merely that our expectations may be mistaken, that in any case must be admitted. I mean that, taking even our firmest expectations, such as that the sun will rise tomorrow, there is not a shadow of a reason for supposing them more likely to be verified than not. With this proviso, I return to the meaning of cause. Those who disagree with Hume maintain that cause is a specific relation, which entails invariable sequence, but is not entailed by it. To revert to the clocks of the Cartesians, two perfectly accurate chronometers might strike the hours one after the other invariably, without either being the cause of the other's striking. In general, those who take this view maintain that we can sometimes perceive causal relations, though in most cases we are obliged to infer them, more or less precariously, from constant conjunction. Let us see what arguments there are for and against Hume on this point. Hume summarizes his argument as follows. I am sensible that of all the paradoxes which I have had or shall hereafter have occasion to advance in the course of this treatise, the present one is the most violent, and that tis merely by dint of solid proof and reasoning I can ever hope it will have admission, and overcome the inveterate prejudices of mankind. Before we are reconciled to this doctrine, how often must we repeat to ourselves that the simple view of any two objects or actions, however related, can never give us any idea of power or of a connection betwixt them, that this idea arises from a repetition of their union, that the repetition, 
neither discovers nor causes anything in the objects, but has influence only on the mind by that customary transition it produces, that this customary transition is therefore the same with the power and necessity which are consequently felt by the soul and not perceived externally in bodies. Hume is commonly accused of having too atomic a view of perception, but he allows that certain relations can be perceived. We ought not, he says, to receive as reasoning any of the observations we make concerning identity and the relations of time and place, since in none of them the mind can go beyond what is immediately present to the senses. Causation, he says, is different in that it takes us beyond the impressions of our senses and informs us of unperceived existences. As an argument, this seems invalid. We believe in many relations of time and place which we cannot perceive. We think that time extends backwards and forwards, and space beyond the walls of our room. Hume's real argument is that, while we sometimes perceive relations of time and place, we never perceive causal relations, which must therefore, if admitted, be inferred from relations that can be perceived. The controversy is thus reduced to one of empirical fact. Do we, or do we not, sometimes perceive a relation which can be called causal? Hume says no, his adversaries say yes, and it is not easy to see how evidence can be produced by either side. I think perhaps the strongest argument on Hume's side is to be derived from the character of causal laws in physics. It appears that simple rules of the form A causes B are never to be admitted in science except as crude suggestions in early stages. The causal laws by which such simple rules are replaced in well-developed sciences are so complex that no one can suppose them given in perception. They are all, obviously, elaborate inferences from the observed course of nature. I am leaving out of account modern quantum theory which reinforces the above conclusion. So far as the physical sciences are concerned, Hume is wholly in the right. Such propositions as A causes B are never to be accepted and our inclination to accept them is to be explained by the laws of habit and association. These laws themselves, in their accurate form, will be elaborate statements as to nervous tissue, primarily its physiology, then its chemistry, and ultimately its physics. The opponent of Hume, however, even if he admits the whole of what has just been said about the physical sciences, may not yet admit himself decisively defeated. He may say that, in psychology, we have cases where a causal relation can be perceived. The whole conception of cause is probably derived from volition, and it may be said that we can perceive a relation between a volition and the consequent act, which is something more than invariable sequence. The same might be said of the relation between a sudden pain and a cry. Such views, however, are rendered very difficult by physiology. Between the will to move my arm and the consequent movement, there is a long chain of causal intermediaries consisting of processes in the nerves and muscles. We perceive only the end terms of this process, the volition and the movement, and if we think we see a direct causal connection between these, we are mistaken. This argument is not conclusive on the general question, but it shows that it is rash to suppose that we perceive causal relations when we think we do. The balance, therefore, is in favour of Hume's view that there is nothing in cause except invariable succession. The evidence, however, is not so conclusive as Hume supposed. Hume is not content with reducing the evidence of a causal connection to experience of frequent conjunction. He proceeds to argue that such experience does not justify the expectation of similar conjunctions in the future. For example, when, to repeat a former illustration, I see an apple, past experience makes me expect that it will taste like an apple and not like roast beef. But there is no rational justification for this expectation. If there were such a justification, it would have to proceed from the principle that those instances of which we have had no experience resemble those of which we have had experience.